This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My guest today, Colonel Chris Hatfield. Chris is a Canadian fighter pilot, test pilot, and astronaut. Incredible guy. His latest book, The Defector, is out October 10th. And now, without further ado, Chris Hatfield. Look at those good looking books. Uh, there. <laughs> they are. Look at this. And I love this one. I, I read this one a couple months ago when they, they sent it. So congratulations on uh, this. And well, I mean, everything else. I mean, I can't even. Uh, you have had Thanks. quite the run, sir. Quite the yeah, run. I'm, I'm still running. Yeah, it's nice <laughs> to see. We're getting so many. I mean, just great reviews for the defector. I'm really, really pleased because it was a lot of fun to write. So yeah, and and thanks for making time and good. To, what's the uh, what are the two weapons up on the up above your name there? Uh, well, right, this is a Parker right here, so Damascus barrel, very old school. And then right there is a fan made that, and it's an arrow that he tried to recreate something that a tribe in Siberia would have made, and it's a tie to my third novel, Savage Sun. So he used a, a bone for uh, for the tip there, and he just did the did some uh, made some tar uh, to keep the feathers on, and it's it's just it's beautiful. So that went up there, and then well, up here's a little a little bit of aspen or birch or something as the shaft. You know, yeah, he, that's cool. He, he did tell me what that was, and I'm not I have to go back and look exactly what kind of wood he used on that. But up above here, if you can see this above, I'm not sure, but that's uh, 1864 Enfield from Afghanistan from the early days. So before oh, really? too many of the uh, the fake ones started coming over from Pakistan. Um, so that's uh, yeah, that's a that's from the early days right there. Haven't fired my, it. My dad, my dad's a, a big collector and. Uh, of long guns and pistols he's got any he, he's just got an encyclopedic knowledge he's 89 now so it's a really nice uh hobby for him too because he's always thought anything that took a tremendous amount of human skill and ingenuity and machining to make is always going to hold its value and it's interesting to him so he rebuilds old cars and has a collection of old guns and and flies a couple biplanes at 89 years old so in interesting setup that he's got it's a good example to me Wow, good example for for all of us. What did he uh, yeah. What did he do when you were growing up? Uh, my dad was uh, grew up as a farmer, um, but then uh, he uh, trained as a pilot. And um, uh, we got enough time. I'll tell you a quick story. So when he was just becoming an instructor pilot, uh, he took a buddy flying, and the buddy was started getting airsick. And there was this airport under construction, so my dad quick landed next to this airport. And the you know one of the managers came out and said, "You can't land here." And my dad's like, "Yeah, well, look, you know, my buddy's throwing up." <clears throat> he ended up being the first pilot to ever land at that airport, and their first instructor set up the first flying school there. And now that airport is uh, is Chris Hadfield Airport. No so it's a really lovely, way. you know, lifelong come around story. But my dad was an airline pilot through his whole career and an aerobatic pilot. But, uh, wow. but most, and he still farms and he still flies at uh, 89 years old. So uh, pretty amazing. That's incredible. Well, you had it, you had it in the genes, but then you yeah, also yeah. saw, uh, you watched the uh, what Apollo 11 landings. Is that what, uh, what was the first inspiration or were you already on this path to becoming a pilot and then an astronaut? I was first inspired by uh, science fiction, you know, Star Trek mm. and uh, and comic books and stuff like that. I just I just thought, wow, that's cool, you know. And that's that's out on the very edge of what's going on. And 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 but it, it was all fantasy. But you're right. What really um, uh, set my mind and set therefore set my path was people actually doing it, not just, you know, X-Men pretend, but really people actually flying in space. And, and the whole thing culminated the, the, the global interest, you know, uh, of people when, uh, when Neil and Buzz walked on the moon in July of 69, I was just nine years old. And I just thought, wow, yeah. if, if that's a thing that people can do, I want to do that. How do I do that? And, and so I consciously decided uh, to turn myself into an astronaut um, as a result of watching the people walk on the moon and everything else has sort of been the granddaughter of that. 
Incredible. And now you're talking, didn't you do, uh, you, your, are your friends or, you know, uh, William Shatner and some of these guys from the shows that you watched growing up? Yeah. <laughs> it's so cool to get to know. Uh, I mean, I've done several projects with, you know, it's Bill Shatner with, right. with Bill. And, uh, I mean, he's what 92 now he still works seven days a week. You know, he just, Amazing. he loves what he's doing and, and he's so fascinated and interested in stuff in the world and hard charging kind of guy. So, and yeah, it's, it's lovely, uh, to get to know the people that you only saw one dimensionally or or two dimensionally when you were growing up to actually get to know them as complex people and and yeah you, know, you, you get to know everybody now you know I, I could name drop like crazy but it's lovely getting to know people who have found tremendous success and also been an inspiration to others and, and see what makes them tick and and maybe try and learn something from them as to maybe how to conduct life better. Oh yeah. No, I've noticed the same thing now with, uh, some touch points in Hollywood and with other authors that I read growing up or watched on the screen growing up and now having conversations and, and, uh, having them exceed expectations. And, uh, especially from my uh, viewpoint as a little kid, eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, 11, 12, and watching these guys. And now you're having a zoom call with them or, uh, or talking to them about books and discussing projects and all that. It is, it's really special. It really is. You know, yesterday I got an email from Brian May, you know, the lead guitarist of Queen. And and he's a friend. And I like Brian. He's a really thoughtful, sensitive guy, tremendously talented, and a PhD in astrophysics. You know, he's not just one of the world's great guitar players and songwriters, but even still, you know, even though I've commanded a spaceship, it still, you know, makes me smile internally to get an email from Brian May. It's just, it's a, a cool facet of this stage of life. That's probably, that, that, and he's probably saying a similar thing about you saying he's not just a, this world-class pilot and astronaut and commander. He's also this guitarist. He's probably saying the same thing, just opposite of, of you, I bet. That's, <laughs> uh, it's a nice way to go through life being yeah. delighted by the things that are happening for sure. Oh, that's fantastic. And so you, so July 1969, you watch this with the rest of the world. And then what um, active steps do you take from that point forward that uh, leads you into the military academy and then um, and moving forward? Yeah, from there? I, I, I had no idea, Jack, I, but I, I just I kind of looked at the people who were doing it because it's mm -hmm. it's really hard to be something if you've never seen it. If you don't even know it exists, you can't model it. But I looked at the OK, they walked in the moon. So. Who are those people? What did they do? And they were uh, engineers. They'd studied in university. So I thought, okay, well, that sounds interesting. I was growing up on a farm. How does stuff work? I'll study mechanical engineering, even though I don't know what it is, but it sounds logical. And then they fly in space. So I got to learn to fly. So at 13 years old, I joined the Air Cadets, which is a Canadian flying program. In the States, there's like the Civil Air Patrol. In England, there's Air Cadets. And it's just uh, a way that... Uh, the government can help subsidize young people to learn to fly so that maybe eventually they'll become commercial pilots in the country. So I, I learned to fly gliders when I was 15 and powered airplanes when I was 16. Um, I looked at the people that were walking and flying in space and they're all in good shape. So I thought, okay, well, I need to think about what I eat, maybe get a little exercise every day. And, and then I just sort of used that um, uh, seemingly impossible goal as a way to help me choose what to do next. You know, like, what should I do this weekend? What sort of books should I read? What, you know, what choices should I make in life? But when I finished high school, I was, I was not ready to like sign up for the military or go to university. So I took a year off. Uh, I, uh, I worked for a while in a, uh, in a warehouse packing plant, made enough money. And then I went and bummed around Europe for six months with a buddy and learning history, getting to know people growing up, turned 18 there. And that, uh, that was super helpful as well. But in that time, uh, at 18 years old, when I was really choosing what made sense to me, I realized, yep, in, in my heart of hearts, I, I want to fly in space. I, that's what I want to do. So, so I joined the, a Royal Canadian Air Force, got an engineering degree through the military academy, became a pilot, then a fighter pilot. I was a combat fighter pilot in the Cold War. And then I went to test pilot school, just like Neil Armstrong and Mike Collins and Buzz Aldrin had, because uh, it sounded interesting and it, it was on the path. And after all of that, you know, multiple university degrees and test pilot and, and, and all of it, Canada formed a space agency. They had a recruitment 
and uh, a lot of people applied, but they picked me. So, so yeah, it, it was it was planted in my head as a little kid with Star Trek and the moon landings. But uh, twenty five years of decision making that that's what got me into space. Yeah, and so 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. Uh, do you solo first in a glider? Is that how that worked? And then you yeah, solo next. I, uh, my dad was a uh, was a commercial pilot, and so he had a little old tail dragger that I'd flown around in. But I, I didn't have any licenses or anything. But the first airplane that I soloed had no engine. It was a glider. In mm -hmm. fact, the way it got towed up, there's a great big winch on the ground, and it's got a long, long cable, like a you know half a mile cable or quarter mile cable, and you attach to the other end of it, and then. You come, it starts, you know, the, you do all your hand signals, the winch starts spinning and the glider is picking up faster and faster until it can fly. And then sort of like a kite on a string, it gets pried up into the air as it's being pulled in on this winch until you're sort of high enough that you you pull a little lever, it releases the, uh, the cable, and now you're maybe a thousand feet up or 1200 feet up. And, and uh, I did that when I was uh, 15 years old, first with an instructor and then with a glider. Um, and then eventually you get towed by an airplane so you can go even higher. And, uh, and it's a great way to learn even to fly like a, a, a rocket ship mm -hmm. because the fundamentals of preparation and aerodynamics and what we call airmanship, you know, understanding what's going on and, and all weather and everything else, you got to learn those somewhere. Yeah. And, and I learned those uh, as a 15 year old uh, flying gliders. No kidding. So I, in my, my latest novel that I'm working on right now, my seventh one, um, there's a, it, it starts and there's this aircraft that even when I read the book back in the summer of 1985, uh, it was called a Lake Buccaneer. And it was, uh, he's got Lake Aircraft Company. I think it was called at the, at the time. It's I, I, I've flown a Lake Have Buccaneer. You? No kidding. Great workhorse of a little airplane. A lot <laughs> yeah, of fun. Flying boat, uh, traces its roots to like Groom and Goose and Mallard and all those things. And he, so even back then I said, I want to put this in a book someday and it hasn't been natural until this one. So I, I found somebody on Instagram that, uh, that that there's a whole community. It's kind of like land cruisers. Like there's this group of people that love land cruisers. Well, there's a group of people that love these uh, these planes, these Lake Buccaneers, and they all get together in Florida or lakes across you know the country and yeah. and link up. And uh, so I reached out to somebody and he uh, he walked me through it. And I was doing all my research and uh, I really want to get down there and fly in one though. So I have the invite. Well, I need to, they're, need they're, to do it. They're great tough, reliable, rugged, uh, solid little airplanes to bomb around in. And and uh, I was uh, an astronaut in Houston and one of the flight controllers at a Lake Buccaneer. And uh, and we went out into the, the big Galveston Bay and landed on the ship channel, you know, in so we'd taken off from, a, from Laporte Airport, but now suddenly we're out over the ship channel and we landed. And then he like drove it and taxied up onto one of the man-made islands out in the middle of the Houston ship channel. <laughs> and, and we got to, you know, get out and walk around. And it was just technology enabling uh, something that otherwise would be impossible. I just found it delightful. But to be able to operate out of salt water, that's a really uh, great, as you say, evolution of the of the Grumman, all those Grumman amphibian airplanes. And uh, and it was a lot of fun to fly. And, but, yeah. but, you know, it does what it does really well. And, yeah. and uh, it, it's sort of like a lovely tool, like a, yeah. a really exquisite hammer to drive in a specific type of nail. And it's a great little airplane. Uh, very cool. Yeah, I've, I've been infatuated with it since I was a little kid. So it, it, it just made sense to bring it into this into this, this seventh novel. Service isn't just what Navy Federal Credit Union does. It's who they are. That's why Navy Federal created tools to help you earn and save more. Make your financial goals a reality with great rates and low fees. Members enjoy earnings and savings of $473 per year by banking with Navy Federal, an average credit card APR that's 6% lower than the industry average, a market-leading regular savings rate nearly two times the industry average. Learn more at NavyFederal.org slash offers. I've been a member of Navy Federal since I enlisted in the Navy in 1996 and have had nothing but positive experiences with them for what is now closing in on 30 years. Wherever we were stationed, whether at home or abroad, Navy Federal was by our side. Navy Federal has made it their mission to help military members and their families tackle home ownership. With their new no refi rate drop option, you can buy a home now. And if rates drop later, you can then lower your rate without refinancing. Plus, they also offer mortgage options with zero down payment. 
so you don't need to wait years to save at Navy Federal. Our members are the mission. Find out more at NavyFederal.org. Navy Federal is insured by NCUA, membership required, equal housing lender, open to the armed forces, the DOD, veterans, and their families. NavyFederal.org. But uh, so, so you're, you're, you have this background. Do most people that you're going through the program with, once you start, uh, once you get to, to college, what, what point do you, do you, during college or right after college, start moving into jets and moving into the military side of things? Do they have a background yeah. similar to yours? Did a lot of people come in having flown a glider or uh, flown a, a single engine plane, having their private pilot's license? What, what was that like? Yeah, well, I, I recognize that if you're going to be a professional pilot, uh, one little accident, like, you know, if you're if you're maybe grinding, sharpening a, a knife and one little bit of metal goes into your eye and you're never going to be a pilot again. So I recognized, hey, I need a backup plan. Um, astronauts have backup plans. So I uh, I got an engineering degree. And also I knew if I ever was going to become an astronaut, then I was going to need the engineering degrees. Um but my flying training with the military, you go through what they call basic flying training, but it's more um, a chance for them to see what aptitude you have. Mm. And not just hands and feet, but also aptitude for learning and, and making decisions in three dimensions okay. uh, when you have to, uh, or irreversible decisions. Most people don't like making those, but yeah. as a pilot, you got to make them all the time. So uh, the failure rate was huge. We, I think on my basic flying training, we failed over 60% of the people. And then when I got into jet flying, moving from little propeller onto a, a jets, a, a little two-seat trainer jet called the Tudor, um, Again, our failure rate was was uh, up sixty percent. Mm. So it's a pretty rigorous flying program in Canada. We turn out good pilots, and by the end of that, you're not only a good tutor pilot, but you learned a lot about aviation. And then, yeah. no matter what airplane you're going to fly after that, you've got a really good solid pyramid of base underneath you. But I went from tutors, then I got selected to fly fighters, and one or two people out of the whole course would go fly fighters. And uh, I went to F5s, which is a little one behind the other uh, early early jet fighter, pretty limited fighter, um, pretty good for a jet trainer and learned to fly F5s. And then after that, F18s, you know, the movie uh, Top Gun and Top Gun uh, Maverick. That's that's what uh, in Maverick specifically yeah. flying F18s. I got to fly them when they were brand new, mm -hmm. like they were coming out of the factory in St. Louis and they would fly them up to Cold Lake, Alberta. And, and they still had that, that new fighter airplane smell. <laughs> when we got into them. The airplanes only had like six or seven hours on the airframe wow. and now they're turning us loose in them. So, so when the airplane was, was brand spanking new. Uh, and so I, I graduated as a, uh, a combat fighter pilot and then went um, uh, during the cold war intercepting, uh, armed Soviet bombers that were practicing cruise missile launches on North America. We'd have to scramble. We held 24 seven alert and we'd scramble in the middle of the night from dead asleep. You had to be airborne in 12 minutes. You know, lot, you're asleep, the horn goes off and you now have to have your jet airplane armed with missiles uh, airborne in 12 minutes, race out over the North Atlantic and intercept the Soviets before they could, you know, show them that we could uh, intercept them before they could get to the line where they could release their cruise missiles. So, so that 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 quick progression from glider pilot, powered pilot, jet pilot, fighter pilot, and now defending the country. That's so wild. Did you, uh, so? What was the the Soviet bomber that would be uh, that would they were practicing over the Arctic, the Tupolev or something? Yeah, it was built by the Tupolev company, mm -hmm. and uh, they built a bunch of different models. Uh, but this one, the colloquially we call them Bear bombers, okay. and they're um, propeller driven. But they have this big engine, but they have one propeller that spins this way, and right behind it, a propeller that spins. I don't know if I make my uh, hands yep. do that, but one propeller spinning one way and one spin in the other way, counter rotating props, so that you get. Um, minimum drag and maximum thrust and they got four of those and it's pressurized so they're up uh low 30s like 31 32 000 feet and they would launch out of the northern soviet union and come down in between greenland and iceland okay. uh and, and come in on north america and sometimes they were just on their way to cuba and sometimes they were following attack profiles and, and when when you intercept one uh they're noisy 
I mean, even though you're inside your cockpit wearing a helmet, uh, you know, inside a pressurized cockpit, those eight big droning propellers make a racket up there. And we'd go intercept them really careful um, how it is that you get around behind them. And then as you come up, uh, you come up on the left side and we modified the Canadian F-18s with this enormous, I forget, half a million candor power light. So if it was dark, You'd come up beside this big thing. You could see the the glow out of the engines. And then with the baby finger, you'd flick on this enormous searchlight on the side of the F-18. And then with just me alone in the cockpit, gently moving my throttles, or th- my rudders and throttle and stick to, to have a good look, identify which model of bear it was. Um, and then and then they gave us a camera. You know, this is before digital cameras. So I had a a handheld camera on a pistol grip, me flying the airplane in the darkness out over the middle or the edge of the Atlantic uh, and and taking pictures of this so so that then we could peel away and come back. And we're a fully armed F-18, got heat seeking and radar seeking missiles and a nose full of bullets. So, you know, we're we're right at the edge of the Cold War defending against these big bombers. But fortunately, none of them were actually hostile. It was just that game of of sable rattling and showing capability, but never uh, actual firing of a missile in anger, which I'm thankful for. Yeah, Gee, I picture those planes as kind of like the uh, the AK-47 of bombers. I don't know. That's in my mind. That's how I I think of it. You know, I picture us and having uh, you know, this technological advantage, but then I pick let's but a short circuit might. I put you put you down for a couple of days as you figure it out. But I picture those things as just like it just parts like an AK-47, like they're going to work and it's going to get you there. Might not be. As yeah, technologically I, I lived advanced. in Russia for five years and um, and definitely their engineering philosophy is different. Mm-hmm. You know, for them, absolutely better is the enemy of good enough. You know, if you've got a system that works yeah. and, and, and then then great, use it, you know, don't, don't fret that it's not as good as it might be, but actually use that thing. And then maybe make little incremental improvements over time. But, but, uh, you know, everything is, is, uh, Ivan engineering, solid, reliable, and, uh, and, and maybe not technologically right on the edge, but, but serving the purpose and those bear bombers, I mean, they're still flying now, uh, just like the B-52s in the United States. We're going to fly those until those airframes are a hundred years old That's because incredible. it's a good, tough, reliable design. Jeez. I mean, I wonder if some of the more modern stuff that's coming to F-35 and those types of um, 22, like those types of things are going to be in service as long as some of those older aircraft that uh, came out of the 50s and 60s and but 70s. A big a big heavy bomber. You know, I've intercepted B-52s. We would do exercises where they would start over the North Pole and, and they would come down and they would uh, sort of uh, test everybody's air defense system all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and so I was way up in the north, up in the high Arctic in a, in a little town called Akaluit and scrambled up to intercept the B-52s that were coming down. And all I have on board are bullets, heat seeking missiles and radar seeking missiles. The B-52 has this huge jammer. So he could put on enough energy that he could shut off my radar. My radar would have to shut itself down just to keep from frying. Wow. So I can't use my radar missiles. Okay. And then my heat seeking missiles, he's got all sorts of flares and, and, and heat choppers. So you can't really even count on your heat seeking missile. So now all I'm left with is guns in the nose of my F-18. And he's got a bigger gun than I do, you know, uh, with the great big guns on, on the airplane. So uh, part of the reason those airframes are around so long is they are tough, well built, and and they're a proven solid uh, technology. So yeah, they're they're not around because it doesn't make sense. They're yeah. around because they're a proven asset. Yeah, it sounds kind of similar to what uh, I've I've read about uh, you know submarines just through Tom Clancy novels and, and anecdotes here and there. Uh, similar to to what they're doing under the ocean, you're doing up above. Um, but, uh, what a, what a wild it provides time. both of us with a lot of good fodder for writing books. That's perfect. It? Exactly. Exactly. Especially this one right here that you just, uh, that's coming out here, October, it's October 10th for this one. Is that right? Yeah. It's coming out October 10th and it's doing great in pre-sales and it's nice. just getting, you know, it, you know what it's like, it's you write fun. a book and then you're like, well, I think it's okay, but I hope somebody else does. And, and, uh, the defector there sitting on your desk, it, uh, thanks for reading it by the way, but it, it is getting uh, just great early reviews. And I think, you know, the Apollo murders next to it, it's being made into an eight part television series as nice. well. So, so things are, you know, uh, 
for a guy like me, it's it's just uh, I'm tickled. You know, this is such a delight that people are really getting a lot out of uh, out of the books that I'm writing. Yeah, no, it's fantastic, and it's going to inspire a whole another generation. Someone's going to read this in seventh grade, eighth grade, high school, and going to say, "Oh, who, who's this guy that wrote this thing? What, what did he do? Oh my, that's amazing!" And then see something about uh, uh, going to Mars or something about what Elon Musk is doing or wh- whoever, and and say, "Oh, wow, I want to I want to do that." And so I. I these books, fiction, uh, you know, and non, but fiction, um, growing up really inspired me down, down my path into the military. That's where I started it. too. I started with fiction and, and, and then it's the fact underneath the fiction that, mm-hmm. that then becomes your life. Oh yeah. I love that. I love weaving things into my stories that are, that's fact-based and that to causes somebody maybe to, love, to, to look something up or to say, Oh, I, I remember that. But what was that again? I remember that from 20 years ago. Uh, I'm going to yeah. go, I'm going to go back and, and, and revisit that or, but uh, yeah, no, I, and I love the whole process, but um, did you do a uh, exchange? Is that what I, I did an exchange with the United States, uh, one of the military academies or two of them, I think it was. Yeah, well, so I've done sports exchanges uh, when I was going through our military academies in Canada. Um, So, you know, with West Point and Annapolis and uh, the Air Force Academy out in Colorado. Um, But then when I was serving as a fighter pilot, uh, it was back and forth all the time because it's North American air defense. So the two are really intertwined. So I would go down to exercises, especially in the Gulf of Mexico, at Tyndall Air Force Base and Eglin Air Force Base a lot. And then uh, a lot of American airplanes would come up to the exercises in Canada, especially up in Cold Lake with a big exercise called Maple Flag. A lot of the stuff we learned in Vietnam was uh, you have to make your training realistic. Uh, mm-hmm. Otherwise, you're you're going to do badly. And and so the, the training became really good in those places. And so uh, that that's where I spent a lot of my flying career. But then I wanted to be an astronaut. So I needed to go to test pilot school. And there are, at the time, there were only four test pilot schools in the world, one in France, one in England, and two in the United States, one with the Navy and one with the Air Force. And, and so uh, Canada sends one pilot a year for the whole country wow. to test pilot school. And I got picked. Uh, I went to the uh, Air Force test pilot school uh, out in the desert in California, okay. the Mojave Desert at Edwards Air Force Base. Mm, the, where, right uh, the right where, stuff. The right stuff. Where Chuck Yeager yeah. broke the speed of sound. You know, so, so yeah, and that was uh, a year long sort of exchange. And then after that, I did an exchange tour uh, as a Canadian, but serving with the US Navy as a test pilot on the other side of the country over the Chesapeake at, um, at Patuxent River, Maryland, just south of, of DC. Yeah. I mean, incredible. Um, and the right stuff, of course, you read back in the, in the day, I'm sure Tom Wolf, and then watched the, the movie and, um, yeah, that was inspirational reading that back. I read that in Jaeger's autobiography the same summer. I remember. Um, yeah, yeah, Jaeger's. I got to know um, Jaeger a little bit, but Scott Crossfield. Jaeger was the first guy to mock one. Scott Crossfield was the first one to mock two, and, and Scott was the more technical engineering of the two test pilots. So they were both legendary 1950s, you know, cutting edge test pilots. Um, Chuck, fascinating, larger than life personality, Chuck Yeager. Uh, but it's funny because uh, his book, you know, which which was ostensibly an autobiography, but Scott Crossfield, he called Chuck Yeager that famous novelist. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he said, there's a lot of stuff in there that was a little bigger than it actually happened. But hey, what the heck, <laughs> Chuck Yeager. Yeah, he was a combat pilot and yeah. he was the first human being to Mach 1 and, and a brave and excellent pilot. Um but uh, but yeah, being able to fly out there where where those guys had flown and and, and right back to the very roots of, of cutting edge aviation. And while I was there, um, it was the return to flight after the Challenger shuttle accident. So we were there on those first shuttle landings after the return to flight in the late eighties. Um, and so it was, it was a fascinating, probably the most challenging and interesting year of my life, learning to be a test pilot and. and uh, I flew 32 different types of airplanes that year, all, you know, uh, high performance airplanes, learned a tremendous amount and then got to go be uh, an F-18, A-7 test pilot with the Navy. Uh, All all fascinating, all a great, you know, potential career for the rest of my life. But all of it in the back of my mind sort of set myself up that maybe someday with all of this, somebody would pick me to be an astronaut. 
it's amazing. And uh, yeah, for those who haven't read uh, Chuck Yeager's autobiography or uh, the right stuff, uh, highly recommended, especially for kids in high school and and uh, and middle school because that's when that's when I read them, and it was uh, it was so so inspiring. Uh, I saw something with Dennis Quaid recently. Somebody asked him what his favorite movie was. And without hesitation, he said the right stuff. And he said it was just incredible to be a part of that and to have Chuck Yeager on set. He said every day in the interview. Um, but uh, that was pretty cool for him to just yeah, write Chuck's away. in that movie, right? Chuck yep, had a, he sure a, is. Cameo. A, a cameo role in there. Yeah. Funny. <laughs> yep. In the bar, in the bar, which I, which I believe was based on a real, uh, a real bar out there. So, in, so uh, here, here's a quick story for you. Um, the commander of Columbia, which, uh, which unfortunately came apart in 2003 and killed the crew. The commander of that spaceship, a good friend of mine, he was on my test pilot school course, a guy named Rick Husband, great guy. Uh, anyway, Rick, one day after test pilot school, he was tasked to take, take Chuck flying in a, I think they're in an F-15. Yeah. And um, so he, he's going to take this, you know, Chuck was in his late 70s, I think, or early 80s at the time, going to take Chuck flying for the day. Okay. And so he takes Chuck and Chuck, He's like, he can get away with anything at that stage of life. Like, who's he got to apologize for? So they just did everything they could with that airplane. And they say, hey, let's go buzz my sister's house. And and Rick is like, well, where does your sister live? And he's, oh, Chuck's is here. I'll fly us over there. So Chuck's flies him over. And his sister lives like in the San Francisco Bay Area. Wow. And, but Rick is like, oh, man, please don't lose my license. And uh, and they're so there they are with Chuck Yeager at the controls, buzzing Chuck's sister's place with Rick trying to keep him out of trouble and then bring it back. And wow. you know, it was Chuck Yeager and it didn't really do any harm. So everybody <laughs> let him get away with it. But yeah, an, an amazing uh, historical figure and nice to have got to know him just a little bit. Yeah, that's incredible. Did uh, how, how did they start you out in test pilot school with, uh, I'm sure, I mean, obviously there's a curriculum, but did they start you out on certain aircraft and then transition you into foreign aircraft? Or how, how does that how does that progression work as you're going well, through all it, these different aircraft? In order to go to test pilot school, you have to have a thousand hours high performance already. So th they know you can fly. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, if you're flying 32 airplanes in a year, that means you're probably going to get one day to prepare to fly an airplane. Wow. Like some of the airplanes... I flew once. I flew that airframe once. And on that flight, uh, I, and it's a single seat airplane. And during that flight, you know, I, so I start it, fly it, take it off, take it out, do uh, some sort of evaluate uh, a weapons delivery with that airplane, and then take the airplane up and do out of control work with it, you know, oh. tumble the airplane and evaluate different ways to bring it back under control. And oh. then you bring it back and evaluate the landing handling characteristics and everything, and then bring it back in and shut it down one flight in your whole life in that airplane and you have to do all those things so absolutely the biggest part of test pilot school is study and learning and the cerebral task of mm. it and um in the in the uh mornings we would fly airplanes because that's often in the desert it's not too windy when the weather's better and then in the afternoon you're in class all day long learning all the all of the theory you know you do a whole theory of performance do a whole theory of handling qualities, and then you do a whole theory of systems, and that fills the whole year. Um, and then, uh, so airplanes in the morning, and uh, and theory and study in the afternoon, and then at night, just all hours study and preparation because you got to write reports on everything that you've flown so far, and then learn a whole new airplane. You know, one day you're flying a a little single engine propeller airplane, next day you're flying a a C5 or a C141, you know, great big transport oh airplane. Goodness. And and so it was it's like like uh like getting a PhD in flying uh, in that year. Incredibly <laughs> demanding, uh fascinating, and really tough on family. Like I would spend yeah. Sunday mornings with my family and the rest of the time I just worked the whole yeah. time. But uh fascinating course and uh and I learned a huge amount and Pretty much everything I learned in that year of test pilot school, I used in the three years that I served in the Navy, um, developing new airplanes and things uh, as, a, as a U.S. Navy exchange test pilot. The pod cover by Eight Sleep. As an author writing late into the night and as a parent with three kids who get up early, I need every second of sleep I can get. That's where the pod cover by Eight Sleep comes in. The pod cover by 8sleep fits on any bed like a fitted sheet. The pod cover will improve your sleep by automatically adjusting the temperature on each side of the bed based on your and your partner's individual needs. 
It can cool down and warm up and adjusts based on the phases of your sleep and the environment that you're in. While temperature is the biggest game changer, the pod cover has other features. For example, thanks to the pods, sleep and health tracking, you can wake up to a personalized sleep report each morning that offers insights on how certain behaviors like late night exercise or caffeine impact your sleep and overall health. Invest in the rest you deserve with the H sleep pod. I sleep great on mine and you will too. Go to eightsleep.com slash danger close and save $150 on the pod cover. Stay cool with eight sleep. Now shipping within the USA, Canada, the UK, select countries in the EU and Australia. Remember, that's eightsleep.com slash danger close. E I G H T sleep.com slash danger close. Is there in that during that time frame, was there one? after flying all those planes during that year, was there one that you absolutely loved and one that you were like, I never want to get back in that aircraft again? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you know, we did, so I, I did a whole test program with gliders because let's say you're a glider pilot and, um, and you, you were getting hauled up by a, an airplane and your tape, your rope broke or your mm -hmm. cable broke. So now you're not as high as you needed to be. So now you got to land someplace you weren't planning. Mm -hmm. So what's the best thing to do? Should you just hold the best gliding speed and look for a place to land? Or should you dive down and get super close to the ground? Because when you're really close to the ground in a glider, you get more lift. You can actually, mm. a lot of people think you can go a lot further because of the ground effect, mm. but no one had ever tested it. So here we are with this huge flat lake bed. And, and so my big graduation project out of test pilot school was to prove whether or not gliders should go down into ground effect. So what we did because we needed to now fly across the desert at 20 feet above and then 15 feet and then 12 and 10 and eight and six and five. How do you hold altitude with to within one foot? Uh -huh. So what we did is we took helium balloons and we strung them across the desert at exactly the right height. And then when I, I'd get my glider up and I would dive it down and then you could line yourself up perfectly visually with these balloons. So then you could just be driving across the desert, slowing down and slowing down until, um, until you didn't have enough speed to fly anymore. And then you just land because you're out in the middle of the lake bed. So that was a fascinating and probably one of the more interesting um, programs of the whole test pilot school. And we found out that you shouldn't in a glider, oh. don't use ground effect because because the trade-off's not worth it. And, and wherever you run out of energy, that's where you got to land. And that's it right. might not be where you want it to be. At least when you're coming down carefully, you can make choices. Yeah. Um, Let's see. What was the worst thing I flew there? I, don't know, I love all airplanes. They're they're all I a can lot tell. Of fun to fly. But I flew the the Navy has an anti submarine airplane that's based on a, on an old commercial transport. And the Navy it's called the P three Orion. In the Canada it's called the CP one forty one. I think Aurora. Um, big four engine long range. Uh, platform. The airplane's just sort of a transport plane and you can put anti-submarine stuff in it. It'll go a long way. But from a fighter pilot's point of view, that thing was just just a big lumbering <laughs> tank to fly. And it felt even though I flew 747 and C141 and C5, that P3 felt like the biggest, heaviest, most uh uh, I don't know, uh, least responsive airplane of anything I ever flew. I felt like when I put a command control in, it was like, you know, hey, pilot the engine room, we want to turn left. Uh, and sometime later, the air and everything was uh, big and heavy. So yeah, I'm not, there's going to be a lot of uh, anti-submarine pilots who are mad at me now. But for <laughs> me, that's probably the airplane I would like to fly the least. Is that the one that makes that weird sound when you're coming in for landing? It goes like, womp, womp. I remember there was one that came over the beach in Coronado that would always make this sound on its approach. Yeah, probably the those uh, variable pitch props coming in and and a big, heavy, lumbering airplane. Uh, the guy's playing it on the way in. Could could well have been, yeah. Amazing. Did you fly, uh, at the time, Soviet aircraft as well, or is that a different type of a... No, no, I did not. I've flown just some private Soviet aircraft, mm -hmm. but um, you, you know in the defector... Uh, uh, the United States was flying Soviet airplanes right from the 1960s on, especially when the the MiGs had been surprising us in Korea. And then the MiG-21s had, it looked like a kind of a nothing fighter, and yet it had been kicking our butts in Vietnam. And so managed to 
uh, buy some or steal some or, or get some people to defect with some. And they took those fight those fighters out to the desert um, in Nevada at uh, Area 51. And uh, but uh, they were still black and secret mm-hmm. and not not airplanes that I was flying at test pilot school. So so, no, I uh, I haven't flown the high performance uh, Soviet airplanes. Got it. Yeah, I've heard of a couple of those uh, those programs back then. I was what a fascinating time to be involved in our intelligence services and the overlap of military intelligence uh, and trying to acquire those airframes, uh, planes yeah. and helicopters, both and figuring out how to either buy them from other countries or through other sources or get someone to defect. And then what do you do with it? And then denying it and getting into these into these black programs and figuring them out and reverse engineering them and then figuring out how to counter and all these things. I yeah, when I was cool. researching the defector, some of those stories are crazy. You know, they were trying to get Iraqis to defect with uh, MiG-21 into Israel. And there were like some Iraqi pilots were coming on a on a flying exchange uh, to the United States. And so they were deliberately targeted, uh, in fact, by, uh, by uh, female spies who were then trying to pick them up in the bar and, and then try and build a relationship with them so that then they could help convince them in order to defect with their airplane. And that's that have, and a couple of them got killed by, by their own military when they went back. It's a whole amazing story that's out there. But one of those, uh, he he took that airplane and, you know, all of the pressure and the other uh, convincing that went on. And he defected with that airplane um, into Israel, landed with almost no gas. And then the Israelis flew the heck out of it for a while because they wanted to know how that air, the MiG-21 worked. And then uh, it eventually ended up out in the desert uh, in uh, at Groom Lake in, in Nevada. And, and it's those airplanes uh, that formed the very basis of, of my story, or at least what seems to be yeah. the basis of my story in the defector. Yeah. Oh, so fantastic. And, uh, what, when, so you at test pilot school when, uh, the challenger, uh, disaster happens or where are you in, uh, when you find out about that? Um, I was a, I was a fighter pilot, um, in uh, Northern Canada. Uh, I remember, I mean, obviously remember the day when just suddenly it was before the internet, but suddenly there was, uh, everyone was saying, holy cow, Challenger came apart during launch today. And, uh, I thought it was my dreams got up in smoke as well. I thought, you know, heck I'm, I'm just a Canadian fighter pilot. I'm not a test pilot. I don't have a graduate degree. You know, I'm so far from being an astronaut and they just, not only killed the crew of Challenger, but they had a school teacher on board, Krista McAuliffe. You know, there's no way the American public is going to trust NASA to launch another space shuttle. So I thought everything was done. Uh, that was January of 86. But um, amazingly enough, they they learned a huge number of lessons and space all space flight will be safer as a result of, of the loss of those lives. It was, it was, you know, we could have avoided it. It was bad decision making. And, and but but you know nothing's perfect, and we learned a lot from it, and uh, and and a lot of space flights have happened since then. But yeah, that was a big, um, a big shocking day. Not just you know, of course, for all the people directly involved, but for everybody on the periphery watching what seemed to have been a miraculously successful program explode and kill the astronauts on board uh, so vividly in front of the parents and everybody else that uh, that it was a really difficult thing to recover from. Yeah, I mean, I was in seventh grade at the time. It was uh, incredibly impactful to uh, to me as well. Um, yeah. But uh, did you st- is that studied uh, throughout the in your in your in your program? Do they st- look at it honestly? Uh, kind of like we do. I think we try to. But most of the things in the military, not everything, but um, a lot that I saw was were honest assessments uh, from people who said, "Hey, we we can't have this happen again. We with these lessons in blood need to be passed on to the next generation. That's what we owe them. We need to take a long, hard look at ourselves, regardless of whose head rolls." Um, what was that? Uh, a few years later, you get into the astronaut program, I think. But what? By the time you went through that program and your time over this, those all these next years, um, when you look back at that, or how have they? Did they look at it with an honest eye and they patented? They you know, passed you know, the lessons Jack, on. I, I was I was in the organization during that entire process, and when I say the organization, I mean um, professional aer- aerospace, because if you think about. Uh, mindset in the second world war when when so much uh, flying was rapidly developed you know we went from slow fabric biplanes to to supersonic jet airplanes all inside of 5 years um but the tolerance 
for uh, for accident and for death, obviously, be, because uh, tens of millions of people were killed in the war. It, it's a it was just a matter of fact. People die doing this. And and that that culture of those pilots, the World War Two pilots and then the Korean War pilots, that culture lasted for their whole career. It's like, mm-hmm. hey, this is a dangerous profession. We're on the pointy end. People die. Get over it. But as the next generation came in in the 60s, there was like, why are we losing an airplane a day? Or I'm sorry, an airplane a week in the Canadian Air Force. You know, do, we're not even at war right now. Why are we accepting this level of death? Why are we doing that? And this this whole new idea of, of flight safety and how do you incorporate flight safety effectively? And as you said, how do you... Um, May allow people to report all the near misses without mm-hmm. getting personal retribution. How do you build a culture mm-hmm. where it's okay to talk about everything that went wrong and the stupid stuff you did and and the stupid stuff the airplane did so that other people can learn from mm-hmm. it? And it was an enormous shift forward in aviation and, and not just in military fighter aviation, but in commercial aviation as well. We, we're shocked now when a commercial airliner crashes. But in the 60s, they were crashing pretty often. We just we forget, you know, and and so that transition uh, of 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 sort of cultural norms um, took place in the 60s and 70s in, in military and commercial aviation. And a lot of those people ended up as astronauts. And so that was one of the very foundational precepts of how we successfully fly in space is flight safety reporting. And the amount of preparation you do for everything, every simulation, every flight, but also the amount of debrief Mm -hmm. that you do. And how do you incorporate all those lessons learned into the flight rules that everyone then lives by? The flight Mm -hmm. rules, that's the big Bible so that we can can codify all of the lessons learned. So, yeah, when something like Challenger happens, there is no stone unturned. And, And you dig into everything and you look at... You know, obviously, spaceflight is going to be risky, but how can we not uh, do the stupid stuff? How can we make better decisions? How can we build better hardware? And, and how can we uh, make spaceflight safer from now on? And, the, you know, the, the space shuttle was an inherently very dangerous vehicle to fly, and we killed two crews and lost two vehicles as a result. But the stuff we learned and the stuff that went into flight rules even after the Columbia accident in 03, mm-hmm. we never had another loss of life, ne- never had another accident and c- finished building the space station, even went up and, and repaired and reboosted the Hubble telescope. So, yeah, it, it, it's a big process, but um, NASA a- and the other professional flying organizations really take it to heart. It's not a bunch of like in the movies, not a bunch of wahoos, you know, screaming and everybody in mission control applauding and as if it's all for show. It is deadly serious. And uh, and we take it all absolutely to heart when we do something wrong. Yeah. And then what's the path into uh, into the into the space program? Canada forms its its own space program. And then there's uh, you hear about this and you put in an application. Or what's this process that gets you uh, gets you into space? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Canada had astronauts uh, by NASA's invitation in 2004, or actually 2003-04. And uh, because we contributed the big arm, the robot arm, the Canada arm to the space shuttle, which, you know, released the Hubble telescope and did all all those other things, Mm -hmm. built the space station, um, then Canada could fly three astronauts. And so in a very rapid time, when the shuttle was new, uh, Canada got invited to send three primes and three backups, so six people. And so we had a we didn't even have a space agency, but our National Research Council hired six people and one of them flew within a year, you know, like from from just being a a military officer to now suddenly being in space in less than a year. Um, But they were payload specialists, you know, just in the not flying the shuttle at all. But but still our first astronaut, great guy, Mark Garneau, and then Roberta Bonder. Uh, But. We decided we needed a space agency. Canada formed the Canadian Space Agency in 89. And then because we were going to start building space station, we needed a whole new type of astronaut, you know, that could that could not just run all the experiments, but also run the vehicles. And so we had a different type of recruitment. And so there I was, a test pilot with the U.S. Navy, and they stuck an ad in the newspapers all across Canada, the want ads. And it said, <laughs> wanted astronauts. <laughs> Crazy. 
And it, it just had to be a Canadian citizen to have a university degree, be able to uh, pass a class one physical. And so like 5,330 people applied. 5,300 people, all by, you know, mailing in their paper applications. Uh, but they eventually chose four of us. And uh, and then I got picked uh, because I'd spent a bunch of time on exchange and was at that stage of my career. I got picked to go immediately down and, and not stay at the Canadian Space Agency in Canada, but immediately go down and be part of one of the NASA astronaut classes. So uh, I started at Houston at the Johnson Space Center on uh, August the 3rd. 1992 as a brand new baby astronaut. Hey everyone, Andy Stump here, the host of the Ironclad Original Change Agents podcast. In addition to producing podcasts like Change Agents, Danger Close with Jack Carr, Oil & Whiskey with Roadster Shop, and others, Ironclad also works with some of the world's biggest brands like Mechanics Wear, Under Armour, the Navy SEAL Foundation, Anthem, and a ton of others to create industry-leading custom film series, commercials, podcasts, and more. We can also get your message in front of an audience of millions by placing it on podcasts and series just like this one. To check out more about Ironclad and see how they can help you elevate your company, brand, or business, check out thisisironclad.com. This is ironclad.com. Wow. And what, how do you, how do you, what's the first, like what's first day? And then when do you do <laughs> start doing the things that we see videos of on, in water and then and doing all that, that stuff with a huge suit on and like, what's the prep? And then how long is it before you actually go up? Um, your basic training, those things you just listed, that takes two years. Mm. Um, and, and so there, it's just, uh, you're in classroom, a tremendous amount. We fly jets, but I was already a jet pilot. So, but for the people who were like chemists and, and, uh, you know, we had one veterinarian in our class and the medical doctors, it's a pretty big step for them. They're not going to be the front seaters, but still being able to navigate and communicate and sit on an ejection seat in a jet wow. was a big step for them. Uh, but then all of the theory of space flight of orbital, orbital mechanics and, and control theory and and then learning um, all of the generic skills of the space shuttle, which was the most complicated flying machine ever built. And, and, and so that was hugely uh, demanding. And then everything else. Uh, and then we started cooperating with the Russians. So starting to learn to speak Russian. And, and then eventually you get through. Oh, here's a funny thing for you. When you're first there, you're not an astronaut. You're an astronaut candidate for the first two years because mm. they want to give you the chance to quit mm. just in case you find out you don't like it. But plus, they want to keep the chance to be able to fire you. If even though you look good on paper, you didn't turn out to be what you wanted. And mm. normally at least one person uh, backs out out of each class or or is let go because, you know, it's just it, it's just the way it goes. But after so when you're an astronaut candidate, guess how they abbreviate that? You're an ass can. <laughs> so there I was one of the best test yeah. pilots in the world. Now suddenly I'm an ass can yeah. and and I'm the bottom of the you know, I'm in charge of the Christmas skit, you yeah. know, for the office. But um but after two years, then you go into advanced training, like spacewalking training and all of the advanced stuff. And then you're eligible to get assigned to a space flight. And then after so several years of basic training and advanced training, then you might get assigned to a space flight. And then training for a shuttle flight was typically 18 months of full time, seven days a week training to get ready for that space flight, which would last about 10 days or so. And so I was selected in 92 and I flew in the fall of uh, 95 on my first oh, wow. flight. Okay. Wow. It's actually faster I than I thought. I just want to say, uh, I have another thing at the top of the hour, so we only got 14 okay. minutes left. Cool. So I want to make sure gotcha. we get through all your yeah, yeah. slates. All right. I'm going to speed up then a tiny bit. Uh, oh, Russia, so your, your first flight, what's your, what's your first flight like, even though you've done all this training and now you're in this uh, in this spacecraft, you have I mean, maybe memories of Challenger um, and, uh, and off you go. What is that like to be sitting in that seat finally after all these years? You know, one of the big things, Jack, is I didn't know what was really important and what was just nice to know when you're a new guy and you're you're studying for a space flight everything how do you know everything's sort of equally important mm -hmm. and you got to learn everything and so it's really demanding trying to learn everything about everything uh and and until you've flown in space it's like you know theoretically learning to ride a bicycle mm -hmm. gosh there's so think about all the little things you have to know but when you actually start riding a bicycle you go oh well 
that stuff you don't even need to worry about. And this stuff is important. And, and but as a new astronaut, gosh, sitting on the launch pad, I, I had been getting ready for this. Your whole know, life. It had been 26 years since I was nine years old. So for 26 years, I've been getting ready for that day. But now you are supremely ready. You've got all that stuff and you're sitting there. I was on the part of the flight crew. I wasn't downstairs. I was upstairs. So you're part of the group of four people that are going to make this happen. And, and it, you're so incredibly prepared and competent and focused. And, and the only thing that you're really worried about is that they're not going to let you go. Mm. You know, you're, you're not, you, you know, you might die, but you've already realized, hey, I'm going to die eventually. You know, so what? The important stuff is what am I going to do today? You know, and how am I going to make this thing work? So, so there's no real nervousness or mm. fear to it. You, you had to have dealt with that years ago. Mm-hmm. You're actually just supremely ready for this thing to happen. And and it it's one of those days you're hyper aware. It all goes by almost in slow motion because you are so tuned in mm. to everything that's going on. And the launch itself is is spectacular. Even even a better and more uh, visceral than, than, than I even dreamed it would be. It's an amazing eight minutes and 40 seconds. Oh, that's incredible. Do you do a spacewalk on this one or is that, is that later on? I, uh, they didn't want to trust a newbie with a spacewalk, (laughs) um, because a lot of people are sick when they get to space, you know, when you get up there and suddenly your eyes say, Hey, I'm sitting inside the space shuttle, but your balance system says, Whoa, you're falling, man. And, and so your body says, what could have made your body think you must have eaten a neurotoxin, right? What else could have suddenly disconnected your vision from your balance system? Yeah. So your body says, throw up. You've eaten something that's killing you. Throw up and go to sleep so you stop metabolizing it. And so a lot of people feel varying levels mm-hmm. of, of space sickness or motion yeah. sickness. And so you don't want to have assigned somebody to a space flight when you don't even know because some people never get over it. Uh, and, and so they, 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 it's kind of nice to have had at least one space flight before you're trusted to do spacewalks. Um, yeah. So on my second space flight, a few years later, I was the lead spacewalker and, and did a couple of spacewalks. And it's the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. That was going to be my next question. And uh, <laughs> yeah, amazing, amazing. But I know I got to let you go soon. But um, so closest call in space or as a test pilot, but um, or both. Um, as a high combat fighter pilot or high, high command, or I'm sorry, high performance combat fighter pilot, um, I blacked myself out in a single seat airplane one day. We were practicing dogfighting and uh, I came smoking into the merge really fast. And uh, and the guy I was fighting against, Denis Rivard, like a lot of us, he cheated a little bit. And uh, and he wasn't supposed to move his airplane until we crossed equal. But he started lead turning me. And I'm like, ah, oh, Denis. And so I slapped the stick into my lap and I yanked my throttles to idle. But as I yanked my throttles to idle, my elbow unplugged my G-suit because the F-18 was new and we hadn't thought about that. And as, so there I was with no G-suit to fight the G and and almost 8G on the airplane. Wow. And uh, I woke up 18 seconds later. Oh, but my. But fortunately, gosh. I'd gone up. So my airplane just kind of went woo up and over. And I woke up right about here. Oh, my. But if I did, instead, if I'd gone down, then I would have hit the ground before I woke up. So that was uh, as close as I've come and quite a, uh, you know, uh, a thought provoking thing to happen. Uh, I would think. But uh, yeah. Um, And in space flight, um, when I was commanding the spaceship, uh, the International Space Station, um, one of the Soviet, or not, well, there's my background showing, Uh the Russians. Uh, Pavel Vinogradov, who is very much a Soviet kind of guy, great yeah. friend, great guy. Looks like um, looks like uh, kind of an old Western guy with a thin mustache. And anyway, he came up to me and you know, it's talking in Russian. He's like, Chris, Chris, is Venetia. You just thought interesting. Like, no, it's it's very interesting. The first time I saw you, Chris, no, you must look at it, And I'm like, what the heck? And he he's saying, hey, Chris, there's there's like fireworks or sparks or something outside. And I went over to the window and we were spewing something out into space. And when we did all the work and talked into Houston, we were leaking the main coolant of the whole space station. Liquid ammonia, our, our the lifeblood that cools the station was spewing out into space. And so uh, we had to do an emergency spacewalk 
and get out there with ammonia all over the place and and uh, replace and hope the new pump module would work. But because of all those years of training and preparation and everybody on my crew getting spacewalk qualified and all the competencies, um, we were only four days away from coming back to Earth. And we managed to squeeze in the incredible disruption of, of an emergency spacewalk and save the day. And, and I handed over control of the space station to Pavel, to oh Pavel Vinagrada. Uh, great relief. He looked like, like Charles Bronson, you know, that kind of face. Anyway, um, so that was, because uh, if we hadn't been able to stop that leak, it can't cool the station. Basically, you're going to have to abandon the world's space station, you know. So it was that was a big deal. But oh uh, but we, we solved it because of all the time and money uh, people had invested into making us competent, doing our jobs up there. And we got to come home, you know, having set records for the amount of science done and save the station and, and triumphant. So, in fact, it turned out to be a, a victory. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to try to get three more quick ones in. Director of the Cosmonaut Training Center in Star City, Russia. How does that work? Yeah. I know we only have a yeah, couple so minutes. I've been in Russia about crazy. five years. And, and did your family go with you? Uh, uh, I studied the language. What did you say? Did your family go with you too? Everybody's over there? <laughs> yeah, I studied wow. Russian for 20 years uh, oh. so I could speak it okay. And um, uh, and NASA would keep one person to be the director of operations, of all operations in Russia. And they're based at Star City, Russia, which is the little um, – a paramilitary cosmonaut training base has been since Yuri Gagarin and Valentina Tereshkova. Um, and, uh, and I did that job for two years. So I lived and worked and ran the office uh, at the Yuri Gagarin cosmonaut training center. Centra Podgatovki Kosmonautov. And um, it was a great job. It's a beautiful place. Mm. You walk to work through the woods. I had a terrific group of Americans and Russians working for me, great people. And, you know, it's why I look at the Ukraine war. And I mean, Putin is, is, a, is a criminal and a gangster. And, and he's got he's built the machine that is doing horrible things. But don't write off everybody in Russia. You know, they're not just a monolith. It's just a bunch of people. And most of them, what are they going to They can't leave. You know what? Anyway, so so I, I I'm completely against what Russia is doing. But I also have a great understanding and sympathy and hope for yeah. for the just the common Russian people who are bearing the brunt of the impact of this. But anyway, so yeah, there for two years and Amazing. great job, fascinating. And my family, um, my kids were in school over here, so they'd come over on all their vacations, okay. and my wife would be there about half time yeah. uh, while I was there. So yeah, I got to know Russia pretty well. That's amazing. And I know you got to go, but uh, it's been in the news recently, so I have to ask. UFOs, have you seen anything weird over all these years flying and then in space? And what are your thoughts on the whistleblower? I know we don't have much time, uh, well, but what are your... I, I, I'm, I'm very evidence-based and I've been a pilot my entire life and spent many thousands of hours. I've lived in space. Um, I've worked with all of the astronauts of, from all around the world. Um, my dad is an airline pilot who has spent 30,000 hours at altitude. Both my brothers are airline pilots. Be, you know, in my family, what do we have? Almost 100,000 hours of flight time. And nobody and nobody that they know has ever seen a UFO. So when I hear of one whistleblower or I see a little bit of glinting on some HUD tape that most of the people don't know how to interpret it, I'm just naturally suspicious. It's like, okay, well, you know, what's a whistleblower? Anybody can blow a whistle. What are, you, what are your actual credentials? And I'm convinced there's, there's extraterrestrial life. I mean, you'd be a fool not to. There are an unlimited number of planets. There are there are septillions of planets out there. And so to think we're the only one that generated life, that's just kind of arrogance. But it's also arrogance to think that intelligent life is traveling through the entire galaxy and 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 then just sneaking around where only clever people manage to detect them. You know, to me, that doesn't make any sense. So so yeah, I it's fun. It doesn't do any harm. I don't mind people thinking about UFOs or UAPs or whatever you want to call them. Um, I'm sure there's life in other places in the universe, yeah. but I, I, I'm I have more than a, than a grain of salt with which yeah. I take all the latest breathless announcements. And you got to look at it from the U.S. government's point of view. Hey, it's fun. It does no harm. It allows us to fly secret airplanes around and pretend they are UFOs, <laughs> and nobody has to worry about it. So what's the harm in it? And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I'm not worried about it at all, but neither am I invested in it at all.
Got it. All right, I gotta let you go, but Aquarius Underwater Laboratory, where did this come in? Yeah, if you wanna train to live on a space station, um, it's really good to live in a hazardous, unescapable environment with your crew for a while because it builds the right mindset and, and sense of uh, irreversible responsibility. And so there's a habitat uh, on the bottom of the ocean off the coast of Florida, and uh, NASA trains crews there. It's called Aquarius. And uh, and so I commanded a crew for two weeks living at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and it was great, a fascinating, beautiful place to be, but also a really good place to, uh, as an analog, as a place to build the skill sets that you need. So then when you're up on a space station and, and you can't come back suddenly and and you need all those interpersonal skills as well as the technical skills, it's it's a great proving ground. And, and we use it and other, and other simulators regularly to get our crews ready to go live on the space station and soon uh, to go live on the moon. Amazing. Amazing. Well, I could talk to you all day. I know you got to go. Uh, thank you for spending this time today. Thank you for all you've done for Canada and the United States and for inspiring this untold generations. They're going to have these books. There's a nonfiction out there as well for everyone watching or listening. Apollo Murders is out there right now. Defector is awesome and it is out there on October 10th. So be sure and pick these up and and uh, the social channels and every, all the ways to uh, follow along with you will be in the, in the show notes. And uh, thank you so much. This was fascinating. Thanks, Jack. Great to talk with you. And, you. and uh, I look forward to reading every single one of your books. Oh, thanks so much. Take care. Be well. Bye. Black Rifle Coffee Company. You can help Black Rifle Coffee raise $1 million to benefit veterans through the boot campaign. All you need to do is grab a can of ready-to-drink coffee online or from your local grocery or convenience store. The Boot Campaign is one of the most renowned veteran-focused nonprofits in the country, working tirelessly to provide life-changing aid and benefits to service members and their families. Join forces with Black Rifle in the Boot Campaign from May through the end of the year, where every can of ready-to-drink coffee you buy will contribute to making this massive donation possible. Black Rifle ready-to-drink coffee is available in several great-tasting flavors on the Black Rifle Coffee website at your local convenience or grocery store. And no matter where you are, you can fuel your caffeine fix while supporting veterans. Every time you crack open a can of ready-to-drink, you'll be making a huge difference in the lives of veterans and their families. Black Rifle Coffee is committed to serving the veteran community, and with your help, we can all continue to make a difference. Let's raise a can together to keep fueling Americans for a good cause. Check out blackriflecoffee.com slash danger close and use code danger close 20 at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. Blackriflecoffee.com slash danger close. Drink up. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the danger close podcast. First off, thank you to Sig Sauer. This is the cross right here. This is the rifle that I used at the Sig Hunter Games a couple years ago, which was an incredible event. Sig Optic right here, Spartan Bipod, and absolutely love this rifle. So SigSauer.com, check out the cross. It's awesome. And look at this book right here, John Plaster. So I've read a number of John Plaster's books over the years, and he sent me this one, SOG, A Photo History of the Secret Wars. So, John, thank you so much, and thank you for your time in the jungles of Southeast Asia and for all the lessons that you've passed on to my generation. So this thing is a sweet book. So thank you so much for passing this along. And DC Vintage Watches, this is a 6619 Seiko right here, and uh, it's on an original strap from the 1970s with a Waytham compass right there so dc vintage watches check them out and thank you so much for this incredible piece of history right here and uh man i absolutely love this so thank you and here we go primalbeef.com so my friend sean glass and jocko willink from the seal teams have started this company primal beef go and check them out click on their social channels from the website primalbeef.com they sent me this box and delicious Thank you guys. So be sure and check all that out. And until the next time, take care out there. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. To find out more about Chris Hatfield, what he has going on, be sure to go to his website. That's Chris, C-H-R-I-S, Hatfield, H-A-D-F-I-E-L-D dot C-A. And follow him on Instagram at C-O-L, Chris Hatfield. 
And be sure and pick up his latest book, The Defector. You can follow me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA. Officialjackcar.com is the website. Click on shop in the upper right-hand corner for the merch. And if you enjoyed this conversation, be sure and leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Until the next time, take care out there. Stay safe. Be strong. Keep fighting. <laughs>